also did. I was just you just managed to avoid them. I was just really good at nice. writing. Nice, nice. Oh, what is, so assembly is that like um you go every morning and it's like everyone's there. Is that it's what you're talking like about? if you get there early, right? For you guys or well, for us it was just every Friday. Um, we had right after recess we had like a full school assembly, and what that consisted of was just like. Here's the headmaster. He's going to talk for a while. Here's the sports reports. We lost. Um, <laughs> here's a musical performance. Hey, it's actually kind of good. Unless it was uh, the seventh graders playing. And then it was like... Oh, poor seventh graders. Um, but yeah, it, it happened each week. Uh, we had to sing a hymn, a hymn. Despite the fact that we were a secular school. So that was always interesting. <laughs> and yeah, it, it was an experience. Okay, well, what was assembly like for you? Every morning, if you got there more than, if you got there half an hour early, basically it ran from 7.30 until like 8.05, 8.10. It was just like throw everyone in a room, give them all the announcements about anything that could be happening, happening. Uh, give them motivational talks, stuff like that. And I was like, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not going to happen. I'm going to escape. I remember at one point we had, um, we had a motivational talk from Malcolm Turnbull, um, oh. you know, mm -hmm. ex-Prime Minister of Australia, uh, and a Sydney Grammar old boy. But he showed up, and <laughs> what we thought, what we're pretty sure happened, right, he took out his phone, he set a timer, and then he just started speaking. Right? Like, <laughs> we're pretty sure he did not have a script or a speech or anything like that he was prepared for. But, you know, he was just like, eh. I can, I've been in politics long enough, I can talk to a bunch of um, teenage boys about whatever I want. This'll work. Mm -hmm. It worked well. Was it inspiring? No, I can't remember what he said. Oh, well. But it, it was a good speech. Okay. I think that was my strategy there too. By the end of the year, I was like, okay, I have to talk for half an hour. Uh, three general ideas. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. That was definitely the vibes. Um, of, so for my announce, for we had announcements, which was basically the same thing. It was um, 30 minutes every Monday, every Wednesday, and it was the most obnoxious thing because it would basically be every leader of every club would get up and line up, and then all of the teachers would get up and like yell at you about some random thing, and then all of the club people would line up, and they would tell you about their club, and they would tell you to join their club, and it was really funny towards like when you would get to the seniors because there were some seniors who were very clearly there for college apps and so they would be like okay I have an announcement for this club I'm running and then also I have an announcement for this club I'm running and then also I have an announcement for this team that I'm trying to start in the, and there would be like some people who were doing five announcements because they had started five clubs mm. in their <laughs> senior year mm -hmm. it was messy I don't think I ever announced stuff because I was doing tech for announcements Usually I'm the one speaking, as we can see here. And on that note, good after morning and welcome to On the Dome, a podcast about how non-expert college-age youth think. And today we've been speaking about speaking, and I think we are going to continue speaking about speaking because we are theoretically all public speakers. Well, we do our best. We do our best. So do you want to introduce yourselves and specifically what public speaking you've done? Sure. So I'm Liam. Um, I'm a student here at MIT. Um, in terms of public speaking, I joined mock trial here. Um, that was somewhat a spur of the moment thing, but uh, ended up really loving it. Back in high school, I had done a little bit of mock trial, a lot of Model UN, and a little bit of debating, um, as well as, you know, here and there, speeches. Um, even, uh, even back when I was in... Um, elementary school I entered this speech competition and lost horribly but it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. yeah and uh, I think on a similar note for me a lot of my high school was me giving speeches whether it was something planned out in advance or my school was like we have 20 minutes left and we don't have a speaker can you do it so uh, I got a lot of my experience from there and I also did acting for a while so while well, not exactly public speaking it was public acting which involves speaking in public not necessarily. Yes. What if it was a mime role? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I think you could pull that off. Mm -hmm. I think I could. 
Well, I did speech and debate for years and years and years. So I did both public forum, original oratory, which is 10-minute prepared speech. And then, yeah, I was also the resident, if you want someone to talk at people for 10 minutes, get her. Um, I was my graduation speaker, which was really cool. And then I did a lot of um, speeches for assemblies. That was very fun. How did you, how did you get into it, Liam? Well, um, I, I've always been a bit of a talkative fellow. Um, my parents called me loud, uh, <laughs> and they were right. I, you know, I, I've been, I've needed to work on modulating my volume and all sorts of things for since I can remember. <laughs> but I've always kind of enjoyed, you know, talking, presenting. Um, at least I've enjoyed it a lot more than you know the other parts of things, so preparing stuff to present and all that. <laughs> um, and I, by dint of just who I ended up hanging out with, all that sort of stuff, I ended up having a lot of friends who were similar in that respect, you know? Um, friends on the debate team, friends in Model UN, all of these sorts of people, and I was like, you know what? This looks kind of fun. Might as well give it a shot. Um, but I guess even before that as well, it was just... You know, I, I was always more than happy to give things a try, and, you know, like, back in grade seven, uh, when I first joined my high school, you know, my master of the lower house, he was like, hey, could, could you give a speech in assembly? Uh, that's, that's what we called the, that's what we call, I, you know what, that, that's, that's a good question. Master of the lower house. Master of the lower school, yeah, he's, um. It sounds like, did you go to Hogwarts? It, it, it looked exists. like it. Actually, there was a place in Sydney that looked a lot more like it, but um, he's basically just, you, ha you have the headmaster, and then you have, like, headmaster light for year seven specifically. Um, oh, and that's the master of the lower house. I don't know if there's an equivalent to that. Did you guys have... There was not. Like... We had different principles for um, the high school versus, like, the junior high people... Yeah, yeah, I kind of like so that. Yeah. Yes, we had our middle school head and our upper school head, and then we had our principal who did nothing. <laughs> yep. Whoa. Flamed in public. <laughs> R.I.P. Hmm. Um, no, I'm sure he did lots of things. He was less. He was less of a student-facing role. Yeah. So he did nothing with us. I'm sure he did very important things that we don't know about, but. Yeah. But yeah, for where I started my public speaking, it was also seventh grade actually, um, and I was sitting at home, and then a teacher sent my mom a text because I would not respond, which was like, "Hey, we have a event in a day and a half, and we need someone to speak, and we don't have anyone, and I think Fadis would do a decent job at it." And I was like, okay, I guess. And uh, I just kind of went for it. And I never I never went out there like, ooh, I'm going to become the public speaking guy. But then uh, after a year and a half, I looked at myself. I was like, oh, no, I'm the public speaking <laughs> guy. And it just kind of went from there. Uh, and I think, like, public speaking, acting, there weren't anything I was trying to, like, go into specifically. But... Uh, I like to put a bit of flair in what I do, a lot of showmanship. Uh, that's how I entered the room today. But, you know. Music playing. It, it was a good entrance, yeah. We heard yeah. you before we saw you, yeah. Exactly. Uh, I like to put on a show. So <laughs> I think uh, when you enjoy that, public speaking comes kind of naturally, kind of follows you around. You end up roped into it. So in that regard, was there any specific type of public speaking that you enjoyed most or...? Was it just, hey, I'm on stage, might as well have some fun? <laughs> Is that... Yeah. I get that. I also started public speaking in seventh grade, so oh, I think shoot. there's a theme. Um, what happened with me was uh, we had, like, middle school clubs that we could do per quarter, and all of sixth grade I was just doing all these, like, stupid random clubs, like fun clubs. Um, and my mom was like, in seventh grade, first quarter, you have to do speech and debate. And I'm like, I'm going to hate this, but Fine. And I ended up doing speech and debate for six years. So who was right? Um, but hey, that doesn't mean you didn't hate it. I know a lot of people <laughs> who've done stuff for six years and hated it all the way through. I, here's the, well, my mom was right, and I did love it, and I was. <laughs> it was like 
most of my life for like middle school and a lot of high school actually. But I started speech and debate because my mom said I argued too much and she wanted me to do something with <laughs> it. Um, and yeah, I had a really great partner, one of my best friends, um, and we just really loved it and we got to go to all these different tournaments. Eventually I got into speech very randomly. My coach was like, everyone has to do a speech event and I'm like this is stupid and then I did the speech event and then I got into state and I was like this is less stupid now (laughs) and yeah and that's why I'm here I'm sensing a recurring theme of uh you being forced to do something going this is stupid and then oh actually yeah this this is kind of fun yes that I feel like a lot of my life has been like that it's like people tell me to do something and I'm like no and then I do it anyway I'm like okay maybe actually I, I was just wondering um in terms of, you know, your, your mom's plan to get you into speech and debate as an outlet for your arguing, did that backfire? Because did, did that just mean oh, you were yeah. better at arguing? Oh, yeah. Because mm. now what she'll say is, stop using your debate voice on me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be like, in point A, and in my contention one, I actually said, if, you'll, if you go back to the text, oh, we... Oh, <laughs> my... Yep, there is absolutely, like, debate voice, <laughs> public speaking voice, mock right. trial voice. I'm trying to find my podcast voice. The number of times I've objected to people, uh, just in normal conversation. Objection. Ace Attorney style. Mm. I feel like I can tell that you guys did public speaking based on the way you talk. Mm. Well, I think that's a compliment. Yeah, Yeah. like I'll take it. I I am specifically talking about, and I can point to it more specifically in Liam, the way that you pause between your points. Very specifically, and also we were talking about the rule of three. Oh yes, which yeah, you yeah, always of do. course. You always have to when you're listing adjectives, examples. There always have to be three for tricolon. Exactly, mm. you got to do the tricolon. But yeah, I think that you have a tendency to pause to emphasize things, which makes you sound a lot more prepared than you are. I'm trying to do it right now. You know what the secret to that is? Mm-hmm. Being completely unprepared and having to pause to come up with things to say. Yeah, exactly. If you just you just let it flow, just let it happen, mm-hmm. and you do that too. It's slightly because you have a, more of a mock trial voice that you can bring out. I know I know what that is. I don't know exactly what the competitive acting voice is like, but the competitive acting voice varies. As an actor, I can fluidly <laughs> change roles. Yeah, it's more subtle. <laughs> it all depends, you know, what the role is calling for, right? Of course, of course. Yes. Everything is a... Well, what is it, the quote? It's like, life's a stage and we're all just players in it. Oh. Is that... Who is that? Yeah, um, I'm sure it's by someone important. I think that's Shakespeare in Macbeth. Oh, wow. Um, I studied Macbeth. I should know this. <laughs> I also studied Macbeth. I do not know this. I have not studied Macbeth, so I'm exempt from this one. <laughs> no, no. If you haven't studied Macbeth, you should be the one to one-up us and know it. Yeah. Oh. Uh... <laughs> I, well, I think you sort of exemplify that, to give you a compliment. <laughs> you know, life is a stage, and you just have to go out and perform. You have to be the main character sometimes. Yep, yep. Uh, this is bugging me. The, the Macbeth quote might be slightly different, but it's mm-hmm. bugging me. I'm, I'm, I need to remember this. Did you do any Shakespeare in high school? Um, Hamlet. Hamlet. Interesting. Yeah. Did you ever have to, like, do, do the thing where you, like, read it in class and, like, you each are a character mm-hmm. and then you go through oh, it? That was fun. That mm-hmm. was fun. Yeah. We performed Hamlet, too, as Ooh. a class. Which um, character were you? The Grave Digger. Mm. Uh, because we had to like split it up among 60 people or whatever right yeah so, yeah yeah yep. uh i greatly improved the grave digger scene by changing whatever song he was singing to <laughs> smash mouth's <this> all-star <laughs> nice. so i walked onto stage started digging somebody once <laughs> told me well that sort of improvised I, I think that is at the core of what shakespeare would have wanted mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. shakespeare was for the people Shakespeare was and for the people, you yeah. You know what else is for the people? It's Smash Mouth's All Star. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, but like, that's absolutely true. Like, you know, we, we treat Shakespeare as highbrow literature these days, but like, there's a sex joke every 30 seconds in Shakespeare. Yes. It, it was for the people. It was mm-hmm. for the people. Shakespeare is hilarious. If you have a good teacher who can actually show yep. you that it's hilarious. Yep, 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 yep. If you run it through like a translator or something, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I imagine, like, if we all spoke Shakespearean English, Shakespeare would be so easily hilarious to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes. It would be like uh, Monty Python. Yep. Monty yeah. Python's great. Not, not the type of humor that works for everyone, but oh, I love Monty Python. If, okay, if Monty Python doesn't work for you, that's a deficit on your part. I feel like that is an unfortunate reality of how, like, I... It upsets me so greatly to think of people who can't enjoy Monty Python. That's so unfortunate <laughs> for them. This is the hill you'll die on. <laughs> we did Monty Python. I was in, like, a little summer camp thing, like an acting summer camp all through, like, elementary school, and we did Monty Python every year. It was just different scenes from Monty Python. It was so much fun. That's, that's fun. From, from the show or from the movies? or I think it was from the movies. I, I'm thinking of, like... African swallow versus oh. European swallow, and then the coconut, <laughs> which was always really fun. <laughs> what is your name? What is your quest? <laughs> what 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 is it? What is the um, what is the velocity of a African swallow, late, like laden down with what is it? No, so the question something like what is the velocity of a swallow laden down with something? It is laden down with. I'm, I'm glad we yeah. both remember this yeah. specific yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but then the response is African or European. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very important to know. Monty Python's great. Monty Python is great. Mm -hmm. That's definitely one of those things that makes you want to speak or to act. It's like that type of script or that type of seeing that makes, makes you really excited. Did you have anything like that where it's like you saw it and you were like, I want to perform this, I want to do this? Mm. I think I've definitely seen roles where I'm like, I want to do this, but I've also looked at it as any role. I'll aim for a role that I want, but even if I don't get that, it's like, whatever role I take, I'll just kind of tweak to my to my perfect <laughs> role, if the script allows it. Obviously, if it's, a, if it's a serious character, I'm not turning into a joking character, but I liked to have the opportunity to kind of make myself into the role and also make the role me, kind of find a middle ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. No, I think, I think that is a very interesting question, right? Um, and, you know, I'm searching through and trying to think of something for me, but I think what really, like, drew me to public speaking mm -hmm. wasn't so much any sort of role or anything specific like that, but more just the fact that I love being the center of attention. <laughs> um, and just kind of... yourself in this podcast. I had no say in that matter. You centered me. <laughs> um, That's true. I like inch by inch. I had to move four inches. This, yeah. But no, when I was, um, well, yeah, you know, just as a general tendency, right? Like I like to have attention on me, eyes on me, right? It, it could be a bit of a problem, right? But in the context of you know public speaking, of acting, of debate, of what you name it. Well, then it's less of a problem, right? Because at least it's being channeled into something vaguely productive. You have to be at least a little bit of a narcissist to be successful at any of these things. And that's a good thing. That's a nece necessary narcissism. You know what? I'll, I'll, I'll try and justify it that way. Necessary <laughs> I, narcissism. Okay, because I, I feel like I definitely have to be a little bit of a narcissist to do this, to do any of my... I was stuff. about to say, have we seen me... Like, I think all three of us are in the same boat on this one. <laughs> oh, yes. Necessary narcissism, or at least we'll call it necessary. We'll, we'll call it necessary. We'll we'll try and argue it. Self congratulate each other. Woo! Let's, let's go. Me off. Woo! Deck me off. Oh, jeez. Oh, that was too far. <laughs> there you go. Yes, slightly uh, better. But yeah, no, it. You know, pretty much each of the things that. Uh, I ended up getting involved in was part of just like, ah, yeah, this is going to be fun, you know? And I guess for some people it's the opposite experience, right? They, the reason they don't like public speaking is because they don't like being the center of attention. They don't like all the eyes, all the focus, all of the, uh, you know, even judgment or th whatever people are thinking on them. Mm -hmm. To me, it's, it's just fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's... But that said, cool. you know, I still don't know whether I take criticism well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um, there's definitely sides to that. I think, I haven't, I also don't have one. It's funny, I asked the question, but I don't necessarily have, like, a piece of literature. I think back to, like, 
growing up, my childhood best friend would read her little sister, like, stories, and she could do the voices, and I couldn't do that, and I was like, that's so cool, I want to be able to do that, and then I got into speech and debate, and then it became, whenever you had to, like, read something in class, and everyone was like, I don't want to read it, and they'd be like, someone has to read this random paragraph of, like, 18th century history, I would be, I would raise my hand, and I would just, I would go for it. Oh, absolutely, I would, like, yep. fully, like, I would be, like, go into the character, I would do it, dramatic <laughs> yep. pauses yep, yep, yep. and gestures, and one time, we had to do, like, a poem in class, and I read it, and I think I got around round of applause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in my memory, that was what happened. I don't know if it actually happened, but it Excellent was work. great. But, yeah, that sort of stuff. I wanted to be able to read things and make them sound interesting. No, no, I totally get you. Um, and, you know, part of that whole experience with the, um, with being asked to read stuff in class and no one else volunteering, well, part of that was just I, and, you know, this still occurs to this day in classes here, I'm just like, come on, can someone do something? I hate this pause. Like, okay, one, fine, me. Take one for the team. Yeah. Um, but part of it, of course, is that, you know, as already established, yeah, I, I liked reading. I thought I could do it well. I, I liked being the center of attention. It was fun. Yeah, I've already done that uh, here because I had to do a presentation for one of my classes. Um, we're writing like uh, essays about, or more of like papers about iconic design items in history. Mm -hmm. And they told us, okay, uh, you have to present as if it's like a product pitch. You don't know that your items fit uh, like iconic yet. You have to pitch it to us. And... Um, they kind of had everyone go, everyone was kind of going for a, like, uh, I guess, corporate meeting kind of thing, right? Hello, this is my product. It will be good because X, Y, Z, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I walked in, had my cowboy boots on, <laughs> suit jacket, long oh, trench yes. coat, big belt buckle, put on my best southern accent. It's like, how do y'all come on down to Airstream DFW? <laughs> Gave him a whole dealership ad. <laughs> Do you remember uh, PowerPoint Karaoke at IHQ? Uh, I was at about IHQ? to mention right. PowerPoint Karaoke. PowerPoint Karaoke. Yeah, no, that was fun, too. We had a great time with that. Yeah. We, um, we went to, what was it called? Hot Wings and Hot Pitches? Some, yep. Something along that line. There was a PowerPoint Karaoke event at IHQ. Mm. And was this months ago now. Yeah. Um, but basically... What is IHQ? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that. it's one In of the buildings over that way. Yeah, Innovation HQ. They work on... Uh, they work a bit with the Sloan Business School and like mm -hmm. all the student resources for like more uh, more business focused events, mm. but they're a lot of fun. Continue. Um, so yeah, we went there. Uh, it was months ago at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of just spur of the moment again. Um, but you know, it was free food and it was also ah, PowerPoint karaoke. That's a lot of fun, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, just. What was it that I ended up giving a pitch on? I think it was, uh, well, I mean, part of the thing was the PowerPoint made no sense at all. <laughs> but I, I think I ended up making an argument for... Kitten... Oh, wait, no, <laughs> ants. It had something to do with ants. It had something to do with ants and something to do with cats. Like boots for cats, mittens for cats, something like that, to protect them from ants. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, I think it was boots for cats to protect them from ants, you know. It was just kind of going through the presentation, getting new pieces of information as the rest of the audience was, and just trying to translate it into something that made sense. Well, it sounds very necessary. It's a scourge of our nation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think one of the first facts that came up in the PowerPoint was just how many ants there are. I know. Horrifying. It's really, we have, we have to do something about it. This I'm is for so cats. Glad. This is the second time in two days we're on a conversation about ants. You realize this, right? <laughs> Uh, just a question for people watching. Please leave it in the comments. How much surface area would 17 <laughs> pounds of ants take? We need to know. We're, we are very curious about 17 this 17 pounds of ants. You know, we, so, we have lounge funds oh, uh, no. because we're in a social lounge in our dorm where basically our dorm gives us money. So we have 45 pounds of exotic bananas that we have to get. Forget the bananas. Let's buy 17 pounds of ants. We have an can, experiment we need to run. We do both. This is, okay. Are, all right. Is this a surface? Is this surface area moving ants? Well, so so here's the thing, right? You know how ants can like lift ten times their body weight or whatever. Right. Well, Ellery is 170 I, pounds. Seventeen pounds of ants could theoretically lift Ellery. They'd have to 
have to really work together. <laughs> but ants do that. Ants already work mm-hmm. together, right? Okay. So now we incentivize them. So now, yeah, I mean, look, we, we talked to, like, I'm sure someone in the biology department mm-hmm. will be able to tell us how to work with these ants properly. But the question is, the, the main issue, right, besides, you know, incentivizing the ants, right. is just, would the surface area of that many ants be more than the surface area of Ellery? Oh, I see, I see the issue. Right? Because then the ants would have to be carrying other ants as well, and that just doesn't work. Yeah. Physics of it doesn't make sense. Exactly. Well, it also would ideally be that the surface area of 17 pounds of ants would be half of the surface area of Ellery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, ideally. you know, just, I guess surface area might not be the perfect descriptor, but, you know, just like, if we were to lie Ellery down on the floor... Can we cover him in 17 pounds? <laughs> yeah. Ellery is a friend of ours for yeah. people who don't know. He might not be after we he cover him with 17 be. pounds of ants. <sighs> well, we'll have to do that after next week then because we want to have him on the podcast. And so <laughs> if he's, we, need, we need him to still be friends with us. We'll, Maybe we could threaten him with the ants if he doesn't oh, show up. Oh, I see, I see. We'll so take it is, into account. Okay. Well, I'm glad we have a plan. Yes. <sighs> It's so interesting because now I'm thinking about public speaking, obviously through our conversation. I thought you were I'm, still going to be thinking about the ants, yeah, but, uh, but but go on. <laughs> yes, pivoting back from the ants, we can we can we'll re- we'll revisit this. Um, <laughs> but pivoting back to public speaking, it's interesting because now I'm thinking about public speaking, and so I'm really trying to like do public speaking, like speak in a way that I like really like. Uh, I'm trying. I'm analyzing my words as they come out. I'm trying not to say um, or like. I'm putting on my public speaker voice. Wow. Okay. I'm doing my best. She's trying to one up us. <laughs> she, she's she's one upping us. I'm not awake enough for this. <laughs> it is very early in the morning. I feel like I'm trying to match the level of you guys because you guys have very distinct energies. Yeah. Well, is that good or bad? I I don't know. I mean, <laughs> hopefully good. Um. <laughs> I think, yeah, so you, you mentioned, for example, r- trying to avoid ums. And, mm-hmm. you know, when I'm, uh, when I'm a lawyer in mock trial, uh, I absolutely do that. But right now I'm seeing it more as, like, if I'm playing a witness or something mm-hmm. like that, you know. Uh, because now that you've brought this up, of course I, too, am analyzing how I'm talking <laughs> here. And I think what I'm trying to do is just, when it comes down to things like that, If I'm going to hesitate, if I'm going to stutter, try and own it and try and make it purposeful. Mm -hmm. Um, Rather than, well, there, I did it again, right? I'm going to, I feel like I want to analyze what you just said in terms of my public speaking analyzation. Um, What you were doing, you had pauses, which was good because you were allowing yourself time to think. The other thing that you do is you have so many transition words. Just, and I do this too. It's like you... It's like that's one. That's one of them. You come up with all of these transitionary words, such that, see, such that, um, you can buy yourself more time before you actually have to get to your point. Instead, you can distract people by saying, and for example, and by the way, there, you know, this could also take into consideration this, and, and you build this little web of words to give yourself time. And put in some flair with which words you choose, you know, just yes. have a collection that you can hark back to at any time. Yes, hark is a good word. What I'm hearing is we'd make very good politicians. Oh, no. <laughs> saying, all, if, saying nothing with a lot of words? Yeah! Isn't that what, poli- I feel like that's the definition, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, would, I think that would be very funny if we were all politicians. Mm. Not gonna lie, I have considered it from time to time. Well, you're a politician, very technically. You did run in an election. <laughs> well, I mean, I ran unopposed, <laughs> so this is true. And and my um, my platform was based on the fact that I was unopposed, basically, <laughs> and the fact that I was just uh, selected. But you are now Simmons treasurer. Yeah, yeah. So for context. Yeah, I, I am the treasurer of our dorm. Um, it, there's a possibility I will continue to be the treasurer of our dorm even after I leave because I ran unopposed and <laughs> we're having trouble finding candidates. Mm. But yeah, I guess uh, if you extend poli- if you extend politics that far, sure, I guess 
I'm a politician. Politics is a state of mind. Politics is a state of mind, yeah. Although, I guess, you know, you are lounge rep. I am. And I am co-gym chair. And you are co-gym <laughs> chair, so... Wow. We're already politicians. <laughs> we're going to oh, take no. over Simmons. Oh, absolutely. We're, yeah, we already... Well, one of the lounge propositions at one of the house meetings was that Simmons could... Our dorm could become an independent nation. Is that correct? Well, it was to make a micronation. A micronation. On, um, on Simmons land. The issue is, well, we don't actually own Simmons land, so we needed to find Problem. some. But we still do want to make a micronation. I think that's a thing that we should do. Now, elections for that would be very interesting because I suppose probably it would involve at some point three, the three of us running against each other in some <laughs> variety, which would be interesting. Oh, we wouldn't join a ticket, you know? I, I, I that couldn't. would be too powerful. We <laughs> have to, here's what we have to do. We have to do, you know, back in the day how the U.S. government was like, President is the winner of the presidential election, and vice is the second place. That's what we have to do. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> that was an interesting system, definitely. Yes. The reason I know about that Hamilton. is Hamilton. Yep. Do you like Hamilton? No, Hamilton was good. Yes. Hamilton was good. Yeah. Um, one, of, <laughs> one of my friends has labeled me the only valid Hamilton stand, which <laughs> I think is like a backhanded compliment, I guess, or, or maybe it's a backhanded insult. I'm still trying to decide, but I'll take it. Hamilton is how speech and debate kids got into rapping. <laughs> <laughs> or rapping or whatever. What yep. we pretend to do, but now... I feel like a lot of speech and debate kids really like trying to up their, you know, Words speed. per minute. Oh, yeah. Especially, like, debaters, like, policy kids. Oh, yes. Yes. Policy is the debate event where you do what's called spreading, where you talk as fast as humanly possible to the point where it's actually customary to give your opponents a copy of your speech because there is no way that they verbally will understand it. Yep. Yep. Now, I am one of the members of the first debating team at my high school. He would speak so quickly. He was a great debater, right? <laughs> but just the speed at which he could output ideas, you know, he was our third speaker. So he would come up uh, the Australian style, you know, it's three against three, first okay. speaker, first speaker, second speaker, second speaker, third, third. Um, and his favorite position was third negative. So he was the last person who got to speak. And he would just get the final word on everything. Because he could Ooh. speak fast enough that he could go through everything. Yeah. And it was just a lot of fun. I was, I was the second speaker in, you know, public forum, which is 2v2. Mm -hmm. And it was very nice to be second. It, I don't even rem Okay, I don't remember exactly, so I might be saying this wrong, but I think that speaking first and speaking second was unrelated from position in public forum, so you could flip for... Mm. You could flip, and then the one who won could either pick their side or their speaking order, and then the other one could pick the remaining. Interesting. Yes. But it was very nice when I got to have the last word on everything, which was so much fun. Uh, my partner would always be very, because um, we, we had worked together for so long, um, he would be like trying to whisper things in my ear. He's like, mm. say this. I'm like, I know. We've been doing this for a while. I know what to say. Yep, and yep, yep, yep. It would be, it would be fun. No, I think one of the universal experiences of uh, when I did debate was for rebuttal. Right? right before, you know, you went up to give your speech, all of your teammates writing stuff down like, oh, include this, include this bit of rebuttal. Scanning them briefly and then just going, nah, I've got this. <laughs> it's like when, I'm on, when it's my turn to talk, I'm talking. I let you have your turn to talk. And for a public forum, what my partner would be doing for his longest speech was a pre-written so we knew mm -hmm. it was going in there. Mm -hmm. I was the one who got to talk off the cuff. That was my position. That was my domain. Yeah. So I was, I'm in charge. <laughs> now, one of, the, one of the fun things in Model UN was a lot of off the cuff speaking. when, Because you have a lot of things that are prepared, right? But then, some way or another, the debate just devolves into something you aren't expecting. Like, there was a round I was judging where it started as just a, you know, a resolution on fishing rights in the South China Sea. Oh, and we then did that. Mm -hmm. we did that topic. Yep, 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 yep. But then um, <laughs> the, the representatives who were acting as China mm -hmm. decided that the only way they were letting this resolution pass is if we included something, if, if we add an additional clause 
that said that the UN no longer recognized Taiwan. Mm. <laughs> and so the, the entire debate, the entire chamber just pivoted uh, 90 degrees to a completely different topic. And it was hilarious to watch. That's the, that's the thing with off-the-cuff speeches, is you can you have to be ready to go anywhere. Yep. What, I feel like, Ferris, you're going to have some story about how you started a speech doing one thing, and then you just ended up talking about something completely different. Oh, I feel yeah. like that's very much your vibes. I'm just thinking, I think that's every speech. I, <laughs> I can't, can't pick one. But yeah, no, a lot of the time it's like, I'll start, you start off talking about one thing, and then... Half, like I had, I had a script written down. You know, I'm going through it. I got halfway through. I was like, "Wait, this is the part that matters. Everything after this is useless." <laughs> All right, we're talking about this now, and then, yeah, kind of make up, make up everything from there as you speak. No, but that's such a mood. Like, even if I do have a script, and I, pref- I tend to prefer just having bullet points and working off of that, or you know, having ideas that I can then just you know, riff off. But even if I do have a script in front of me, I tend to go, mm, don't love that phrasing, oh, I'm going to change this thing, that thing, and do like some edits on the fly while I'm saying it. Yeah, my scripts would actually be like, I'd go and I'd write out the script, I was like, this is what I'm going to say. But I knew I wasn't going to follow the script, exactly. yeah. so I'd bold like, key words and yep. Like, yep. Uh, sub, like, heading titles, so I could remember, okay, now talk about this vaguely. Yep, 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 yep. No, there was this speech I had to do uh, every year at my high school um, about living in Timor and moving to Australia and the differences. And the thing was, I did it every year, and every year I lost my copy of the script. (laughs) So every year I rewrote the speech, recreated everything, and was just like, okay, this time I'm going to save it. Like, the, the first year the problem was I saved it to an email account that then got shut down. The second, it, it, it was just a weird problem comedy after another. Errors. Yeah, a comedy of errors. So each year I was just remaking this entire thing. And I think at some level that must have improved it, right? Because I'm sure I was a better at writing in grade 11 than I was at grade 7. Well, you hope so. Wait, hey, maybe first... I was just a prodigy in grade 7. It, you know, honestly, I think it has been downhill in a lot of respects since then. What if the first speech was the one that came from the heart and the rest were just There's a possibility. shallow copies? You know, because the first speech was close, was when I was closest to the events, and everything else was just trying to remember. Everything has been downhill since you lost that speech. <laughs> Except for this podcast, New High. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Very nice. Yeah, I had to do, I was also very much like that, that I would have a few bullet points for my public forum speeches, um, and then I would just go. But for oratory, which... The event essentially is you do a 10-minute prepared persuasive speech on something, and Mm -hmm. you just have to persuade your audience something. And for that, I had to learn a little bit more about how to actually write a script and follow Mm. it. It was very interesting for me. It definitely, in the first few competitions, I'd be, like, saying it, and I would just change the wording, like, as I was going on, like, half the sentences, and then the only way that my script would match what I would say is I would record myself saying it and then go back and be like, right. that's what I actually want to say. That's how it actually should be. But then I actually learned, which I was less good at initially, um, more of the acting style of things because since it was a persuasive speech and it was like a fun speech, I was talking about my life. Again, narcissist. Um, and so I was telling stories about my life and I wanted it to be dramatic. And so I would write in kind of speech like cues but instead of writing like what I was I would just write it in like all caps and like I would misspell the words to be how I was going to say them to make it dramatic and all of that (laughs) and so my speech made absolutely no sense to anyone reading it except me and I would have like these little dashes and I'd be like do this here and do that there and yeah so that was what my script became it was a script for my actions because for me that's way less intuitive and then the words were just yeah and was it a memorized thing or yes it was I learned to memorize quick I would write something I think the first time it was I finished my speech on the Thursday and I gave it on the Friday wow and it was 10 minutes that is quick yeah okay got it you you just gotta do it yeah you 
that's the one thing that speech and debate has actually really taught me is how to memorize something really fast. Yeah, I mean, that's a useful skill. My memorization skills have deteriorated a long way. Like, mm. when I was back in um, elementary school, we had a couple plays and musicals, and I got lead roles in them not for any singing or acting ability, because I have no singing ability, <laughs> but just because I was pretty much the only person who could remember the script, and then I could, like, prompt the other people if they needed prompting on their line. And now, now, oh no, memorization is hard. <laughs> like, what? I needed, I did not need those skills now. I need them now. Yes. Mm. Are you good at memorizing things? Um, I've done the same, like, okay, I gotta memorize this speech, but that one was a half an hour speech written Friday morning <laughs> to be presented Friday noon. Wow. <laughs> Because I only found out I had to give that speech Thursday at 11 p.m. Oh, and I was dear. like, oh, well then, wow, That's this is happening. That's amazing. That is a, like, an athletic feat, almost. How, how did you do that? <clears throat> math class. I opened my math textbook. I put my speech in there. I did not listen to math class. <laughs> I still, that's the reason I can't do differential equations. <laughs> what was the speech on? Um, it was supposed to be like, a kind of like motivational, inspirational speech to make people think about stuff, you know? So, uh, I gave one about kind of like how much more, just how much more we have available to us now than like someone all the way in the past. Like, you know, I talked about the, the fact that your phone has more processing power than the computers that got us to the moon stuff like that yeah. and it was just kind of a we have this much stuff available to us think about how much you can do with your yeah. time now compared one to bite of a dorito is more cool ranch flavor than a peasant in the 1500s would have got in their lifetime <laughs> my god you're right i i want to stay in in that conversation that is but yeah. fascinating that you just said that Oh my god! <laughs> I, was thinking about I thought we were going, to I thought we were going like, back there. Yeah. I was like, I guess. No, I'm thinking about the Dorito. <laughs> Shoot. That, man, we have so much more. Every minute of our lives is more experientially stimulating. Oh yeah, than no. Most like people back in the day, their entire lives. Absolutely, like it's something that's actually being looked at a lot in various uh, contexts. You know, if we take a look at politics, for example, and the overstimulation uh, over of media, mm -hmm. you know, because if you're trying to keep up with news, right, and you're just like, okay, well, let's just check, let's just check one website. Let's go to, let's go to The Guardian, see what their most recent articles are. And then the sheer amount of content there is, the sheer amount of things going on, mean that it's impossible to stay up to date with everything, right? You, you either have to take just a really broad look at what's going on in general, or you can pick maybe like one issue to hyper-focus in on. And then, you know, if anyone wants to talk about how the most recent Peruvian presidential election has affected the price of oil in Russia, you can talk about that specifically. Yeah. But there's just so much going on. Well, how has it affected? Oh, I don't know. I didn't read that article. There were too <laughs> many. There are too many. Uh, I think we did a we took we did a topic about Venezuela and oil in debate. So I maybe could still talk about that. Mm. I don't know if any of what I would say would be current because mm. that was three years ago. But yeah, and a lot can happen in three years. A, a lot, lot has happen. happened yeah, in three I was about years. To say, so three years that have counted as a lot more than three years in my books. Yeah, three. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just, just think about what's happened. I'm just uh, honestly thinking about what's happened in the, the, the past four months. It's too much. It's a and lot. And then I realized that that was not all of what's happened in the past two years. Yep. Too much. See, this is. Sometimes, sometimes you want to be the peasant. Sometimes you want to be the peasant. <laughs> life would certainly, I mean, life would not be fun. There would consider, be so many problems, but it would be simpler. Consider this. On one hand, you have to deal with all this. On the other hand, Cool Ranch Doritos. <laughs> oh, cool Ranch Doritos are really good. I don't know how they do it. I want to mm. learn the science of that. MIT should have a class on Cool Ranch Doritos. 
Why not just have a flavor science class? Yeah. General? We should. We absolutely should. Didn't Fury. we used to have a food science major? What? Rip. It was one of the eliminated ones. I R. can't R. believe they eliminated. Like, they just fully eliminated multiple majors. How cruel. And I like that they just eliminated them and then don't reassign the numbers. Yeah. They're like, no, that number is barred. What are you talking about? That, that number never existed. It was untenable. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> untenable. <laughs> oh, dear. That's a, that's a speech and debate word if I ever heard one. Or for you, I guess, a mock trial word. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. But there's also just this really strange but incredibly hilarious video um, I where thought the, it was thought provoking. It was very thought provoking. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> where this guy argues that every number except 10 is untenable and it has right. to go. He right. also has a very strong accent, which is beautiful. Untenable. It had to go. Oh, okay, I see. That sounds very interesting. I can't do accents. Oh, me neither. Like, that is one of the things, just in terms of speaking, in terms of. Um, in terms of mock trial especially, like when I play witnesses, accents are a big thing about a lot of character witnesses, and a lot of the people in the club, they're really able to do accents well. Would you like to reiterate what the uh, judge asked you about your accent last time? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> at one point, um, because my normal accent is this, right? Strange, as yes. we said on this podcast. Yes, wow. exactly. <laughs> At one point, a judge asked, what accent are you trying to do? It's, it's not working. <laughs> you know, you, you should really try and fix this up before Leah, the tournament. Your accent is wrong. Yeah, and I was just like, look, you've got a point. It sounds like a fake accent, but, but there's nothing I can do about it. Like, maybe I need to take some speech classes and learn how to properly do accents, because I would love that skill. Next semester, we're going to all do, like, a character voice class. That would be, that would be so much fun. We should it, do that. It would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you do accents? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. I feel like I can, but also, like, have no clue. They sound right in my head, and that's all I need, you know? How weird it is it to hear your voice not like not the way you normally hear it? So you know, on recording, on video, I know something that like that's that. weird. Oh, I have to. It's so I'm disconcerting. A, I'm gonna edit this. Yep. Yeah. Actually, I don't know. I've never found it weird to hear my voice. Like, really? Watching videos with my voice, and then people are always like, "Oh, I can't stand to hear my voice." Maybe I just love myself that much. You know, it's like that's the that's necessary me. narcissism. The necessary narcissism. I think that that's been the theme of this podcast. And so we'll end on that note. Thank you so much for listening. And this has been On the Dome. Does that can be the title, Necessary Narcissism?